Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Let's stand and worship the Lord together this morning in song. Psalm 41 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard me cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord.
God who never lets us go, the God that gets us through the dark times, the God that is with us during the light. We praise you for that, Father. You are a God who is so worthy of our praise. We look forward to what you're going to do in this place this morning. We look forward to the words we're going to hear. We look forward to the prayers that are going to be prayed this morning, Lord. We pray for anyone in this building today that does not have that personal relationship with you, your son, Jesus Christ, we pray that your Holy Spirit would seek them out and that all of us would be changed in different creatures when we leave here this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
watching on the live stream or even a recording later on, we're glad that you are able to, to worship with us as well, though, in a different way. Uh, by way of announcements, just two things uh, quickly, that this Friday is the Youth Gingerbread House Construction Sleepover. We're going to make some great architectural feats. That's this Friday. We'll meet at the church at 8 o'clock, make gingerbread houses, eat food, have fun, um, have breakfast the next morning, and then it goes till 8 uh, a.m. Saturday morning. So that is this Friday. And then this Sunday, for, for everyone, is the budget meeting after um, church. We're going to have, after Sunday school, a potluck luncheon, and then the budget meeting afterwards back in here. So that is next Sunday, right after Sunday school. And those are the two announcements that I have this morning. So we're going to read from Esther chapter 6. Um, as, as the text that John will be preaching on this morning. Esther, chapter 6, the, the entire chapter, verses 1 to 14, and I'll be reading from the ESV version. This is God's word. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found, written, how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, 
What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak with the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is here, standing in the court. And the king said, Let Haman come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. And let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. And let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city. Proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. That is God's word. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging our weaknesses. Lord, realizing that we are dependent upon you for everything, that in you we live and move and have our very being. Lord, we come before you thankful, thankful for all the good gifts that you have given us, for life and for breath, for friends and for family, and most of all, for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have through faith in him and for the promise of eternal life spent with you in heaven. And Lord, this morning, I lift up those in this congregation who are hurting. I lift them up to you, those who have been struggling with relationships or with sin or with loss. Lord, we bring them to you and ask that you would give them comfort. I pray specifically for Mildred Overholt, Lord, I pray for healing and peace for her and strength. We thank you for the ways that you have already worked in her life. And I pray that we'd be able to surround her with love and her family as well. Lord, I pray for Pastor John as he's coming up here this morning to bring your word to us. I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds, make them sensitive to hear what you have to say to us. Let it pierce to our very soul and convict us of sin and, and show us your son Jesus Christ. Lord I pray that he would have words of eloquence and clarity as he brings them, words of power and that they would be formative for our church this morning, that we would be shaped by your word which he is preaching this morning. And Lord we pray all these things in the name of your only son Jesus Christ. Amen. If you uh, would like to stand with me we will be singing um, the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, as we begin our Advent season. So please stand, and we will sing that hymn together.
You may be seated. Good morning. Wow. We're glad you're here this morning, even if you're not glad to be here. Just kidding. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Esther chapter 6, the passage that Taylor, Pastor Taylor read for us a few minutes ago. And while you're turning there, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to gather as your people. And I pray that you would help us to learn from your word. I pray that you would use my feeble attempt to explain the greatness of your words to us. Help us, Lord, to understand. And then we pray that you would help us to apply this passage so that we could be more like Christ, so that we could be more like your son. So help us now, Lord, in these next moments to focus on you and to learn from your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the Everett's, our family's, Christmas tradition is to watch White Christmas, which we did last, which we did last week. And since you only see it once a year, you kind of know what's going on, what's coming up. You know what's, what's going to be going on in the movie. But I forgot that the heroine, her name is Betty Haynes, played by Rosemary Clooney, jumps to this very large conclusion partway through the movie that um, Bing Crosby's character, Bob Wallace, is just in this major Christmas program. He's just in it for his own good. He's just in it to make money for himself. So this creates a, a, a bunch of animosity between these two characters. And the, once the truth finally comes out, the tension is resolved. Now, I said to Renee when we were watching it, I said, if only she would have talked to Bing Crosby, we could have saved an hour of the movie. And then we were talking that most movies, unless they're shoot 'em up kind of movies where there's lots of blasting in tanks and fast cars, in most movies, there's some kind of conclusion that people jump to. And instead of discussing it, instead of talking it out, they spend an hour fighting about it, and then, and then um, another hour trying to bring it all back together. So do you ever jump to conclusions? Today we're going to see the evil Haman conclude that he is about to be honored above all. But his euphoria that history, that history will record as the high watermark of his evil plot of Jewish extermination will soon be replaced with the realization that his wicked scheme is about to explode in his face. Now, I could repeat that or you could just look at your outline and read that for yourself. In other words, Haman's in deep weeds and he doesn't know it. He's in big trouble and he doesn't know it. So, but first allow me to review how we got to this point in, in, in our story of Esther. Thus far, we've learned of the dismissal of the Persian queen because of her refusal to obey her inebriated husband who wanted to show her off to a bunch of officials and servants. Remember, in that day, Persia was like party central. They loved to get together and eat and then drink too much and just kind of carry on. That was their M.O. We then discovered the process of selecting a new queen. It didn't take us long to realize that in this Persian administration, what was really mattered, mattered was beauty. And, and we saw that beauty was only getting deep when they, when they picked Esther as the queen. Because she went in and she pleased the king, and that was that. She was chosen, Esther the Jew, Jewish lady was chosen to be the queen. Now about five years after she was chosen... This dude named Haman, named Haman, appears on the, on the scene. We're not sure where he came from or how he ascended so quickly to the level of leadership in Hazarus' empire. The point is he did, and once he was there, 
he very quickly laid out a plan, a devious plan, to exterminate all the Jews. Now, remember, if you will, according to Esther 3, 1, that Haman was an Agagite, a relative of the Amalekite king, Agag. About 600 years earlier, God commanded King Saul to wipe out all the Amalekites, to destroy all their possessions. King Saul, in his foolishness, saved the best of the herd, and he spared King Agag. And this occasion, as he looked back on it, caused Haman to hate the Jews and to begin a campaign for their extermination. This crusade against all things Jewish obviously included Esther's uncle, who raised her. His name is Mordecai, who incidentally, as we just read, refused to bow before Persia's prime minister, who was Haman. Now, you can imagine how Haman was really, really angered every time he passed by the king's gate, and this dude named Mordecai would not bow, not only wouldn't he bow, but he wouldn't even make eye contact, and he wouldn't tremble. And Haman is the number two guy in all of Persia. So you can imagine that he was enraged every time he passed this Jew. Then in chapters 4 and 5, we read how Queen Esther literally placed her neck on the block for her people. You might remember her famous words and sacrificial statement, if I perish, I perish. And here's how it kind of went down very quickly. She went to see the king. Remember, she went and she stood there in front of his throne room. And if, if he lowered his scepter to her, she could enter. But if he didn't, and didn't lower it and wouldn't recognize her, she could be killed. So she placed herself in between the king and her people. But her husband did welcome her into his presence, and he accepted her request to join her at a banquet. And oh, by the way, bring that good old boy Haman with you. So Esther prepares a feast. The Persian brain trust shows up to eat and drink. The king asks Esther again, what is your desire? My goodness. He said, my, you know, you can have up to half of my kingdom. All you have to do is ask. Her simple request was, please come to another feast, and I'll prepare that tomorrow, and I'll make my request known to you, and oh, bring your pal Haman with you. Haman left that dinner on cloud nine. He was ecstatic. I mean, the queen invited him to not one dinner party, but two. Esther 5, 9 says this, and Haman went out that day joyful, and glad of heart. He was pumped. It can't get any better than this. But then he passes the king's gate. And there sits Mordecai. He doesn't bow. He doesn't tremble. He doesn't even make eye contact in Haman's presence. And this Agagite proposes to destroy Mordecai before the pogrom commences. Remember, he wanted to destroy to exterminate all the Jews. And about a year later, they had planned that they could go in there and just exterminate all the Jews if they wanted to. So Haman plans to hang Mordecai on a 75-foot high pole. It was more like not a hanging, it was more like an impaling. It's the way the stick was. It was a whole tall tower with a point on it, and they just hoisted him up and on and let him fall down on it. It wasn't a very good way to die as if there are good ways to die. So anyway, we see that Haman wants to take him out, wants to get rid of him. So early the next day, Haman gets up, he makes his appearance before the king to, tell, to explain his dastardly plan, and that brings us up to date in chapter 6. So let us consider Haman's leap and see what God might have for us this morning. The first thing we note is Ahasuerus could not sleep. A sleepless king. On that night, verse 1, on that night the king could not sleep. Now I'm sure that some of you have had problems with insomnia. It's the worst, right? When you can't sleep, there seems like there's nothing worse than not being able to sleep. 
And the more you try to go to sleep when you can't sleep, the more difficult it is. It's, it's more difficult to relax. It seems like all the world's problems come flooding in on you when, when you can't sleep. So what do you do when you're unable to fall asleep? Just lay there? Toss and turn? Some might flip on the TV. I've heard some get up and do housework. Or, or maybe you get up and you read till you're able to drift off. Or perhaps you pray. What does the king do when he's having this sleepless night? He seeks entertainment. The king seeks entertainment. Now, what kind of entertainment? He doesn't bring in dancing bears or, or, or food or wine or anything like that. He requests the royal readers to read to him. Look at verse 1 again. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Ah, the king is read to. Maybe the king just sort of laid there feeling all cozy and kind of comfortable, and the readers read, and, and maybe he was hoping to be bored to sleep, as, as, as some people are, are not all that enamored with history. It's not that exciting to them. But as he listens, something happens. He doesn't fall asleep. No, he is reminded of a very significant event that took place in his life several years earlier. Now look back at Esther chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. And as I read that passage, because this is what took place. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated, it was found to be so. The men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. The readers just happened on this narrative, right? They just stumbled on it. This looks like a good place to read. Now, we all know that that's not true. God had a plan. God had a plan all along, and one that we can trust, and one that, that the Jews could trust. It wasn't just a coincidence. So we see the king seeks entertainment, then the king is educated. Or at least he is reminded about Mordecai's faithfulness and loyalty in, in reporting the attempt on the king's life. The king is immediately concerned about what reward or honor or distinction was bestowed upon Mordecai. He's like asking the question, what was done for this guy? What was done to honor this man? And the servants answer, nothing was done. This was a great and serious oversight. The fact that nothing was written in the book revealing Mordecai's honor meant a severe omission. Esther 6.3 states emphatically, Nothing has been done for him. This is the sort of thing that could result in the king losing face in the eyes of his people, in the eyes of his court. Perhaps the next time there was a threat, a threat was discovered, it wouldn't be reported. The, the king was thinking about self-preservation for sure. The, the servants didn't have to report that. If they didn't like the king, they wouldn't report it. They wouldn't care less what would happen to him, what could happen to him. So the king then, since nothing was done, he desires to exalt Mordecai. The king purposes to esteem or exalt Mordecai for his faithful service, for, for his warning the king of, of what was planning by these two eunuchs. Now what to do and how to honor this devoted and protective servant. In steps the malicious Haman. To help answer that question. So we have number two, the supposing servant, or a supposing servant. The servant, of course, is the one and only spiteful Haman. I can keep using adjectives to explain this guy. Notice verses four and five in chapter six. And the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace. Why? He wanted to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows and that he, had, that he had prepared for him. It was already there. And the king's young men told him, told the king, 
Haman is here standing in the court, and the king said, let him come in. So he invited Haman right in. Remember, just not anybody could walk into the king's chambers. There they had to be extended the scepter. They had to be accepted. But here under this case, even before Haman is standing there, the king says, send them in. Send them, send them right in. Now again, remember what he was planning. What was, was Haman planning? Esther 5.14. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, let a gallows, 50 cubits high, be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged on it, then joyfully, go joyfully with the king to the feast, second feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So he was already, he had it all planned out. He was in, he was there to tell the king what we had to do to this, this guy named Mordecai. Now, Haman, still on, on cloud nine, must have thought, this is the most incredible thing. Look at how this is all falling into place for me. I mean, I didn't even have to stand there with a chance that he wouldn't call me into his presence. I, he's calling me in even before I get there. He showed up early. He wanted to have Mordecai's life destroyed. So hey, um, the king asks Haman the following question. What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? Wow. Wow. Once Haman heard that, I, mean, I just can't imagine how his mood could have soared any more than it already was. And he assumed. The servant assumed. Verses, verse 6b, and Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? I'm the guy. Why would, who would the king want to order, would want to honor more than I, than I would? He said, and, and then not only that, but then he says, the king says, what should we do to the man who the king wants to honor? And he's thinking, wow, I, I, he wants me to tell him what I want for my life and how I want to be honored? Man, this is great. This king really thinks I'm a top shelf kind of guy. Eric Ortland writes, Haman probably saw here a further salve to his wounded pride. And that was in Mordecai's refusal to bow. Additionally, Ortland states, his interpretation of the king's question lets his imagination run free to create whatever recompense he wants. Since he is convinced that it is he himself that Ahasuerus wishes to honor, Haman attempts to be as much like the king as possible. Why? Would he do that? Because a servant was arrogant. This is who he was. He was a proud and arrogant individual who wanted to be like the king. Ian Duguid writes, his request was exactly what we would have expected given the idolatry of public recognition that we saw in the last, chap last chapter. Haman wanted neither wealth nor power. For he had those in abundance already. All he wanted was to be treated like the king in public. Esther 6, 8 and 9 explains exactly what Haman wanted. Esther 6, 8 and 9. Let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn. And the horse that the king has ridden. And on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city proclaiming this this shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor Haman's parade would progress or process pro progress through the populous plaza of the city so that everyone would see the extent of this honor. And do good adds, this was Haman's dream day. This was Haman's dream day. Haman was, proud, was prideful and arrogant. The Apostle Paul warns us as believers about pride, does he not? Romans 12, 3, Paul writes, for the, by the grace given to me, 
I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. Plus, we read in Philippians 2, 3 through 5, Paul again, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And we would be remiss not to, and to fail to quote Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before, sub, before destruction and a howdy spirit, howdy spirit before a fall. Brethren, we must guard against pride in our lives. But again, this is who Haman was, right? He was prideful. He was arrogant. He was overconfident. He was haughty. He never saw what was going to happen next coming. But then out of the jaws of victory comes the agony of the most crushing defeat. It's like a punch in the gut. Esther 6.10. Then the king said to Haman, hurry. Take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so too. He's ready to put that robe on. He's ready to put it on. And he says, do that to Mordecai, the Jew. Do that to Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. And Haman was like, say what? What are you, nuts? What? I, uh, I, I think... For the first time, he was probably speechless. He had to have been stunned. Seconds ago, he was planning this really cool ride around Susa, you know, wearing the king's garb, wearing the king's crown. And now all of a sudden, he was going to be leading this hated Jew who refused to bow to him. He was going to be leading him around the city. He hated no one as much as he hated Mordecai. So what does Haman do? The servant acquiesces. He acquiesced. He did what he had, he, he just had recommended doing for himself. In some respects, he was a survivor, Esther 611. So Haman took the robes and the horse and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming, that means he had to shout, this shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. He did it. He shouted the commanded words, but clearly didn't like it and certainly didn't mean what he spoke. He was going through some motions. Haman had, had been dishing out his murderous attitude, and now, he has, and now he's about to be rewarded, not for his faithful service, but for his foolish pride. This is like what you would call a go what goes around, comes around moment. Haman had been dishing it out, and now he was getting it back. And it didn't taste so good. My friend Ron Cole writes, Ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling Haman had everything anyone could ask for. He was second in power in the Persian Empire. He had power. He had position. He had possessions. He had everything he could want with one exception. And that one exception, Mordecai's refusal to bow down before him, made him ruthless, arrogant, and desirous of even more power to the point of wanting to be acknowledged as having kingly authority. And as Haman watches that unravel, as Haman sees that falling down all around him, as Haman sees what he had hoped for going away, he slinks home. He slinks home. So we have a slinking conspirator. Haman was a conspirator. He had a conspiracy against the Jews, verses 12 through 14. We notice what Haman does after his jaunt through the city square. Mordecai went back to what he was always doing. He's back at the king's gate doing his job. But Haman hurried to his house. He was mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, 
You will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman, Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So the conspirator returned home. He hurried home with his head covered, which was a sign of distress, grief, and mourning. He is completely demoralized and beaten. His plan and position are about to crumble. And as he shares his story with his wife and advisors, I think he's looking for reassurance or at least some hope that this might not turn out as bad as it certainly appears like it will. But then the conspirator, recount, conspirator recounted his experience. Now remember the last time Haman returned home, chapter 5, 11 and 12? And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come to a banquet with the, which, with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow, also I'm invited to go to another banquet with the king. He bragged about himself, flying high as a kite. He was bold, he was confident, he was boisterous. But today he comes home whining and sniveling, complaining, relating negative events of the day. And Haman, verse 11, and Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that happened to him. He recounted this experience, everything that happened to me. Notice he says, he says that he recounted everything that happened to him. Everything that happened to me. He never admits any fault in his fall. These just things just happened to this poor guy. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just a stroke of bad luck. I mean, all he really wanted was to annihilate the Jews. I mean, what's really wrong with that in the overall scheme? Many have tried to do it. And he's just one in a long line of those who have and have failed. But you know, that's the way it is with, with, a, with the proud. They, they never want to accept responsibility. I mean, I could just hear him complaining about, complaining about the Jews. If only those lousy Jews wouldn't have killed great, 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 great grandfather Agag. Or how many greats he have to go back 600 years. More than I think I just did. And we're not told that he was actually, he was a relative, not actually a grand, great grandson or whatever. But the proud never accept responsibility. The blame is never on them. It always gets shifted to someone else. Friends, when you face difficulties and disagreements in the body of Christ, may we always investigate where our responsibilities lie. I always say it takes two to tangle. Where do our responsibilities lie? What have we added negatively to that disagreement? We should never blame others. We should speak, seek the spirit for conviction of our own sin. Perhaps God wishes to humble us or to teach us a lesson, to help us gain some, some spiritual understanding or a spiritual lesson through the hurt and misunderstanding. Perhaps we need to confess sin one to another. Jesus tells us to be peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And James says in 5, 16, Therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and is working. We should confess our sin and pray for others. And we should never recount or repeat or relate or retell church or personal disagreements and conflicts with others and tell, to tell others. Sometimes we need to keep our mouths shut. And then finally, this, the conspirator realized his fall was near. His fall was near. Check this out, verse 13. Then his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, if Mordecai, before you have begun to fall, is of, Jew of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. 
These are the people who a day earlier encouraged Haman to move forward, to forge ahead with his evil plan to hang Mordecai. And now these same people are throwing him under the bus. They're not standing with him. They're saying, boy, oh boy, you are, you are, you are big time in trouble. You are in deep weeds. I, you are just, it, it's just going, it's going bad for you. You're, you're, you're hosed. Haman, Haman seeks his family and advisors advice, but their response is, there's no hope. There's no way out. So they attempt to distance, them, distance themselves from Hale, ha, Haman as he's falling before Mordecai. And now, finally, the conspirator is required at the banquet. Verse 14, and while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Haman hardly had time to think, certainly no time to plot or to plan his way out of this predicament. He was whisked away to the palace, past the gallows that he now had to regret having had erected, He's now near the end of his pathetic life. And you might ask the question, how do we apply this, these 14 verses to our lives? We've seen this evil Haman and his plan that's about to come crashing down on him. He's about to lose his life. So I ask again, do you ever jump to conclusions especially when things look bleak. When difficulties arise, many believers do that, you know. They, 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 they right away jump to the conclusion. And what kind of conclusions do they leap to? They begin to doubt God. They start asking questions like, does God even exist? Does God care about my plight? Does God answer prayer? Is he trustworthy to respond Perhaps you've heard others say that, or, or perhaps some of those thoughts have crossed your mind in difficult circumstances. This leap, this jump to conclusion, should never enter our minds and our thoughts. But if that's the negative side of it, is there a positive side? Is there ever a time to jump to conclusions? And I say, yes, there is. And here's where I get that from. Letter A, God wins. God wins. He was working in the Jews' lives. And we see this evil Haman. He didn't, he didn't kill a single Jew that we know of up to this point. He, he didn't kill a single Jew. God wins. Always conclude that God will be victorious. Jump to that conclusion every time you're in trouble. God is going to win. Now that doesn't mean that somehow we're going to avoid all kinds of pain. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have struggles. It doesn't mean we're not going to have difficulties. But we can trust that God wins. God conquered death and disease, Satan and this world system. And since Jesus is victorious, so are we as believers. 2 Corinthians 2.14 but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. We are in a marching in a triumphal procession. We win too. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Paul says, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 9.24, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the price? Here's a command. So run in that way that you may obtain it, that you may win. Run to win. The hymn that we'll close with today is I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. That was penned in, penned in 1863 by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In 1881, his wife of 18 years was killed in, an, in, a, in a fire. Um, she was fatally burned. Then in 1863, during the American Civil War, Longfellow's oldest son, Charles Appleton Longfellow, joined the Union Army without his father's blessing. 
He was severely wounded in the Battle of Mine Run in the fall of 1863. And the poem tells us the writer's despair upon hearing Christmas bells in December of 1863. And he pens this, and in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Yet pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. God will prevail. God wins. And we can conclude, we can automatically jump to the conclusion that God wins. Next, letter B. God cares for the weak. God cares for the weak. Please listen to these verses. They're in your outline. You can look them up later. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 28. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. Friends, may you and I always boast in Christ because he cares for us. God cares for the weak. He uses the weak and the low to accomplish his purpose. Because the weak, typically, if you know you're weak, you're not real proud. He, he has trouble using the proud. God uses the weak and the low to accomplish his purpose. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who labor and are heaven, heavy laden, and I will give you, what? Yeah, I will give you rest. Are you in need of rest this morning? Then trust in Christ. Make the conclusion that God cares for you. Jump to the conclusion that God cares about you. And 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Does God care about you? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And then finally, God is always at work. God is always at work. Not one of these events up to this point in, e in Esther has happened outside of God's providence. It's, it's all within his planned will. It's all within his providence. God was at work in Esther and Mordecai's lives but he was also at work in King Hazarus and Haman's life also. Even though they couldn't care less about God, they never gave God a second thought. Probably never gave God a first thought. So God is always at work. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2.13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And then Jesus says in James 5, 7, but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. So God was at work in their lives, both the saved and the unsaved. Haman's time on this earth is ending. Unbelieving friend, if there are any here this morning who are outside of Christ, there's still time for you to repent. Haman was about to leave the scene but there's time for you to repent and to trust Christ. Why not trust him today? Why not repent of your sin and invite Jesus into your life to change you, to save you, so that you're able to make those, those, kind, of, those kind of leaps that God wins and God cares for the weak and, and God's always at work in our lives. Come to him today. But if you're here this morning and you're, and you're saying, you know, I don't, I don't want that. I'm going to keep investigating. It's possible that you're, you will have the same end as Haman. 
not impaled from a 75-foot pole. But you will face a Christless eternity. But if you do trust Christ, you'll be saved, and you can approach your life like Mordecai did. He didn't need fame. He didn't need honor. He didn't need the approval of men because he knew God was in charge. Will you not bow the knee willingly to the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will? And when you jump to conclusions, which we're going to do sometimes, always conclude that God wins, God cares for the weak, and God is always at work in your life. Father, thank you for these Old Testament lessons. And we pray, Father, that you would through your spirit, help us to jump to the conclusion that you win, you care for us, and you're always at work. May we never doubt your power. May we never doubt your love. May we never doubt your presence. But may we trust you. And I pray that if there are any here this morning who have never bowed the knee to you, Father, may today be the day when they do that. Father, I pray as we sing I heard the bells. May we focus on the fact that you are a great God and you are totally, totally worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand with me as we sing together. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. I thought. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.